community fans. Welcome to a new episode of West Coast Big Ten, a brand new segment podcast with myself and Bruin legend, Wayne Cook. Wayne, welcome to our brand new podcast, man. How, how you been? I'm amazing, Anthony. Anytime we get a chance to talk a little bit of football and and, and still get to talk about some of the uh, the old the old Pac-12, new Big Ten, it, it's always fun. Always fun. And we want to talk about it from the, we're going to call this the segment from the surf to the mountains. We're talking about Washington Huskies. We're talking about the Oregon Ducks, uh, the the Trojans across town and our UCLA Bruins. So great stuff. Great stuff, uh, Wayne. Thanks for joining in. We're at quarter season in, Wayne. And it looks kind of, it looks kind of funny. The teams that we expected to to play well are struggling and the surprise teams that joined the Big Ten, even Indiana looks strong. That surprised me. Indiana team, Surprise me. Yeah, uh, you know, got to see him up close and personal, obviously, and and Coach Signetti and and what he brought from James Madison, and we all saw what he did there. Brought a ton of players. They've got a receiver named Surratt. Rourke at quarterback is really good, and so he's just brought an attitude. I know yeah. that, like, we, we live in a world now, and it's funny, we're going to start talking about these other teams, but I'm already starting to see it from Jed Fish at Washington. When you go to a new school and we know what he did at Arizona, you know, what Signetti did at James Madison, brought it to Indiana, you can have a quicker turnaround, I think, than maybe in the past. And so what's happening at Washington, if you really look at their schedule with Jed Fish, they could have literally been 5-0 and right now. But they just had a huge win at home against Michigan, and you're starting to see – the kind of stuff that bread that jet fish can bring. And so, and then, you know, in some of the other cases, you know, you start to see maybe some old habits come out too. Like if we start talking about USC, people are a little bit like, Oh no, are, are we going down the Lincoln Riley road again? And so th- there's a lot of storylines. And, and, and by the way, that's not me picking on, on USC at all. I like a lot about their team. Uh, but the idea is, um, I mean, UCLA has got a brand new coach, which is a new tactic, right? You're going to bring in a coach that's never, that's, that's never done this before. So there's just so much going on right now uh, with these teams, but college football has been a little bit crazy. I think, and I don't know if you agree with me, Anthony, but I think that you look at the transfer portal, you look at NIL, and I think we're in an era. And by the way, I think there's going to be some changes coming in the next couple of years to kind of tighten things up a little bit, but we've entered an era where it's just like, you just don't know you go, you're going to have to wait four or five, six games before we find out. I still don't think we know. I still think there's a couple of things. Like, Shit. We just watched Alabama lose to Vandy. Right. Yeah, yeah. By the way, love Clark Lee. He was at UCLA <laughs> at one point in time, but yeah. the idea is, is that I think college football is more confusing than it's ever been. I think the transfer portal kind of, I think it did a disservice to college football as well, especially the NIL. It's a wild, wild west right now. Until the NCAA tightens this thing up, we're going to see a free-for-all essentially right now, right? And you're seeing the teams that you're seeing right now, Wayne, to your point, was the teams are struggling right now. Once they get it together and they kind of bring this momentum next year, they can go through the transfer portal, rebuild the team really quickly. So we're looking at the Bruins, for example. I honestly think they they got better the last game against Penn State. I see a lot of improvement right there. They surprised me, actually, um, Wayne, on that game where the defense stepped up. The O-line played a whole lot better. And I don't know if you saw that as well when you were down there. When when you look at UCLA's schedule through their first five games, you go on the road to Hawaii, and, and it wasn't pretty, but you, you get a win. You know, Hawaii's won a couple of games since then, so it's not like they're losing every game they play. But then the next four, Indiana's 18th in the country right now. Okay, you've got uh, you've got two top five teams in the last two games, Oregon and uh, and Penn State, which are three and four right now. Then you talk about LSU, who's still ranked 13th right now, and their overall record is 20 and one. That is absolutely insane. I was given the analogy since we're we're doing the beach to the mountains that it's like being in the ocean when you get a big wave that just pummels you and then you come up for air and you get pummeled again and then you get pummeled again and you get pummeled again. And to your point, you po- you're pointing it out to me is that you suddenly made strides. They've had to make a couple of changes on the offensive line. I said this a few weeks ago and I'm not going to take credit for it because I didn't tell any coaches. I'm like, we need to try Yoon at center because I know going all the way back to Chip Kelly days, he had told me this guy's going to be good. And I thought Yoon had a very good game in a tough environment, and his snaps were wonderful. I really like Josh Carlin at center, 
but his snaps were a little hot and a little bit off, and it was a, it was difficult. I think he's a more natural guard. Then you lose move uh, Prongos, who's a walk on now scholarship player, who is such a good athlete, to where I think he's got a chance to be a great left tackle. And I think now we're more athletic up front, and we can move better. So to answer your question, it was improvement. The problem for the Bruins is when I look at Oregon, USC, and Washington, all those teams can score points. Yes. UCLA is going through a battle right now where a whole bunch of the fan base is like, we need to play Justin Martin. And I, and by the way, I love the way Justin Martin played. He was great. But I remind people, we only had three points until the kind of garbage touchdown at the end. Three. Yeah. So I, I, people get excited because they go, oh, look at this. And I'm like, you guys, we had three points. So, you know, remember Garbs had 17 in the first half against LSU. So, and the new line I think is better. So I think we're trending in the right direction. For all of these teams, I, I, Anthony, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to get start getting excited here. Have you <laughs> have you looked at the slate of schedule? The, 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 these four teams that we're covering, yeah, are they all? This is this is a great, an absolute. And as a matter of fact, all four of our former Pac-12 schools are underdogs this week. Yeah, yeah. I will, we'll but talk about the spreads, here. Little spreads. And then you know, it's back to the pack. I mean, I love talking about Washington, rich history. Going back to Napoleon Kaufman during that era, you're talking about the Oregon Ducks. Great, great recent history, you know, especially uh, the Chip Kerr, uh, Chip Kelly era. You're talking about SC and our team, UCLA. Now, going back to, to the changes, what I like so far is a team that's surprising so far, Wayne, is USC. That defense, it's no coincidence that their defense is playing well. We have Deant Lynn there. Tell me about some of the things that, that kind of stuck out so far that USC is doing this pretty well. So what I like is I'm, I'm a big Miller Moss fan. I just think that in, in Lincoln Riley's offense, if you go back and you watch him back when he had um, Baker Mayfield, let's just use him as an example at Oklahoma, man, that guy, and he's still doing it in Tampa. He hits that plant foot and the ball gets out. He goes through his progressions. He's got great feet for a quarterback. Caleb Williams was a unique animal, right? He's such a, a, a ridiculously athletic guy. He's got all the arm talent in the world, but a lot of his playmaking ability was off schedule. I actually think that, that, USC has an opportunity, and I know this is going to sound crazy to people, but to even be a little bit more consistent, because last year you saw what happened. It, it got kind of ugly and things kind of went sideways, even though you had the reigning Heisman Trophy candidate. Right. I think you can, I think Lincoln can call an offense that you're going to have a quarterback that's going to try to execute you know, what they do with that talented receiving core. I mean, they've got, they've got three really good receivers that they could throw the ball around starting with, with, with branch, but here's the deal though. For, for me, when I break down USC, it, it's, it's you, if you look at their rankings on offense and defense, they seem to be really good in the pass game offensively, defensively with dang it, Kamari Ramsey and company, Playing defense, that was a former Bruin, that's why I said that, who's a really good player. He's played really, really well for them. Their secondary's been great. It's, yeah. the, it's the line of scrimmage, though. Their, their, yeah. their, their rankings are much worse in both the offensive run game, even though they're okay there, they're not bad, but, but and on the defensive side of the ball as well. And so I think until Lincoln Riley football team gets better in the trenches, you're, and this was a knock at Oklahoma, right? Like we 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 can't just be good at one facet of the game on defense. We have to be good at stopping the run and the pass. And then you start talking about getting into the playoffs and stuff like that. Like that loss to Minnesota last week was it was a was a big one. That's a game they right. gotta get right. And they had some turnovers and they made some mistakes, and and it cost them the game. But I just think that for them. Their goal moving forward is better in the trenches, better in offensive run game and defensive run game. I think that'll help them a ton. And you know what? He's under pressure, too. We're talking with Lincoln Riley here. Now, if this thing doesn't turn around with Deant Lynn, they're probably going to call for, for his job. I'm talking with Lincoln Riley here. So he's getting that pressure, too. Wayne, to talk about that, do you think USC has a chance to make that 12, 12 team playoff at the end of the year? I think with the way they play offense and the way they can score points, I mean, remember they're going to beat Minnesota if they don't turn the ball over. That was, that was the problem in that game. If they, if they play their game, they win that game. And I think they're the better team actually. So I think they have a chance. Um, we, you know, we all know, and I, and I've said this for a million years, you know, all, everybody out there, that's not us, right. That hasn't grown up watching PAC 12. And even when I played PAC 10 football, we've always played really good football. 
in, in the last two years before this year, uh, the Pac-12 actually had a resurgence and had some really good teams. And that included, you know, some of the UCLA Bruin teams. We had a couple of really good years with Dorian Thompson Robinson, his junior and senior year, where we could play with anybody. We didn't win them all, but we were right there. Those teams right now would be doing better. Okay, I don't know what they would have done to get this gauntlet of a schedule, but those teams were like, were like, this team this year is kind of trying to find its way right now. We were better in the in the trenches, but Oregon is right there. They're a team that can compete. The Ohio State game this weekend is so fun for so many reasons because I said this as soon as he left. When Chip Kelly went to work with Ryan Day, my my thought process was, man, they're going to run the football. Yeah, and, gonna, and before we just before we did the show, I was watching. Uh, the the game the the uh, Iowa game and so they're they're gonna run the football and they do run the football. Will Howard's a solid quarterback too, so I think Chip Kelly will have se- success with the talent they have. And they got some really good receivers too, but that's Ohio State. They always do. Yeah. But he's going home, right? He's going back to to and I he had a really cool quote. You'll love this. They talk and I and I look see Chip Kelly has some humility. They yeah. talk to him about like what he built in Oregon. And his quote was, I didn't. Rich Brooks did that. Mike Bellotti did that. He inherited a 10-win team, kind of like Lincoln Riley inherited a 10-win team from Stoops. They didn't walk into a program that was losing. They walked into a program that was winning, kind of like what Caleb DeBoer is doing or Jed Fish is doing. It's a lot harder when you're Deshaun Foster and you walk into a team that's, that's struggling and yeah. you get, or you know what I mean, or even when Chip Kelly took over, walk into a team that's 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 struggling. That's more the point I meant, because Chip Kelly inherited a four-win team at UCLA, yeah. so it took him a while to rebuild that. So, I I don't know. I, I'm kind of sick of oh I don't know how these West Coast teams are going to deal with the toughness of the Big Ten, and I'm like, Oregon's fine. Washington just beat Michigan, and all of you people out there go, well, Michigan's on a down year. Well, explain that to me when you show me all the stars next to the recruiting classes. Yeah. I guarantee you they still got a boatload of four and five star guys. And and Washington yeah. just took it. USC should have beat them. They had a real That's good it. chance to win that game at Michigan. So we're going to see what Oregon does against Ohio State. I actually would probably pick Ohio State if I had to, if yeah. I was forced to. But here's the problem. It's at Autzen. Yeah. It's at Autzen, right? So I think, I, I really do. I think, and I think UCLA is going to start pulling off some wins here too going into the second half of the season. So I think the Pac-12 schools are going to be fine. I really do. I, I, you know, I don't want to talk about coaches. I think Lincoln Riley's fine, by the way. And, and you'll learn this about me, Anthony, and I apologize. I do go off on, like, tangents all the time. <laughs> it's just the way my brain works. But but I, I think Lincoln Riley is a very, very good coach. I just think for all Trojan fans, just to wrap all the way back down to that point, you do have to be good up front in this conference. And I actually think that's what's affecting UCLA right now. Defensive line's awesome. UCLA's defensive front, especially now that they put Femi, if you don't know UCLA football, watch number two coming off the edge. That was a huge move and a great coaching move to move him to the outside. Great uh, move. Jay Toia, who was once a Trojan, now a Bruin, is awesome in the middle. Our linebacking core is amazing, and I like our secondary. If we can just get an offense to go along with this defense, the defensive numbers, and if you look up the defensive numbers, you're like, Cook, you're crazy. They're, but they're on the field all the time. Yes. And our offense has not scored. We've scored the most we've scored this year, 17 points. That's not good. So the defense is being asked to do a lot, but I'm just telling you, they're good. It's a good defense. They just got to figure out the other side of the ball. So I'm excited for all these, these teams in these games, but man, it does not get easy. Every week is an absolute dogfight because there's a lot of good teams in this conference. Well, let's talk about that, uh, that weekend slate uh, real quick. So to your point, Ohio State is in Austin this weekend, and they're three-point. Uh, sorry, Oregon's three-point underdogs. Now, is that fair to say they're three-point underdogs, or is it the three because they're at Austin, or it could have been like if, if they're at Ohio State, it's a, it's a no-brainer win for the Buckeyes. No, 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 no. It's it, I'm telling you, man. Home. I I do a, a another podcast with Phil Still. Phil Phil Steel. I always struggle to say that, and Phil is. He's legendary. He writes a great sports magazine. He's he's incredible, and he he always talks about like certain stadiums get. Usually, it's like three points, right? You get like that three point home field advantage. But there are places like UCLA, which is to Penn State. Yeah, you're gonna get a couple extra points for for, for playing in front of 110,000 people, 
right? That that's a you know when you go to the big house, when you go to the horseshoe, when you go to the when you go to Odson, and yeah. it's so funny because it, I laugh. My buddy Jeff Schwartz, who does a lot of um, you know a lot of radio, and he's moved from Pac-12 over to Big Ten. He's been taking a lot. They were like, oh, they got to expand Odson. It's only whatever fifty something thousand people. They got to make it bigger, and I think they're going to. Yeah. But I'm telling you, I have been there. I've been to Alabama, I've been to Oklahoma, I've been to Notre Dame, I've been all over the, I mean, all over to all these great stadiums. Now Penn State's included LSU. I've been to all these places. Autzen Stadium is electric. It wow. is, so, and, and by the way, so is Washington. Those two stadiums up north are absolutely insane. Like I always say this in Penn State last week, I got the chills at least twice just from what the crowd was doing. I'm like, oh, this is cool. I've been to Texas A&M. I've seen Kyle Field when everybody's rocking back and forth. And I swear you look up and you start getting oh, sick. You're like, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. But when you go to Washington and it's loud, it's loud. When you go to Austin Stadium and it's the end of the third quarter and they're playing, you know, you make me want to shout. Everybody yeah. goes nuts. And it's so freaking fun. So I, I think these Big Ten schools are going to travel to Austin. You better be ready. You better yep. you better be channeling in that crowd noise in practice because it is a loud environment. I love that. And you know what? I my suggestion is this: if Oregon expects to win, they got to do a lot better off the defensive line because the way they played against Boise State, letting Boise run the ball down their throat, and almost lost that game. If you remember that game? So if Ohio State duplicates what Boise State did. I could say it's an easy seven to ten point win for the Buckeyes, but to, to what your point is, Wayne, it's not a given win going to Odson as well. So it's gonna be a great game. I, I th- well, first of all, Boise State has this guy named Genty that's like Barry Sanders. I'm like, my yeah. God, I'm like, I mean, the number you look every time you look at your phone and try, they're like, oh, he has 180 already, and it's like the third quarter. You're like, well, who is this guy? He went for 190 against. Oregon. Now, granted, there was a few big runs in there, but so what? That's what great guys do. So I'm with you on that. I, I think one of the things that Dan Lanning needs to do, and and you know, I, I I've seen I've seen this this one up close and personal too, right? We just played we I was on the field for Oregon. I love Dylan Gabriel. I yeah. think he is his footwork, um, his ability to get there, like there's so many quarterbacks. I watched the game the other day with Cam Ward in Miami. And I love Cam Ward. He's so much. Remember, we watched him play at Washington State. Um, he's a really good player, but he's so good that sometimes he gets lazy. He get, he throws off his back foot when he doesn't have to. He throws sidearm when he doesn't have to. And he's incredible and he's fun to watch. But I almost wish that he had a coach that would look at him and say, "Dude, you can still do all this stuff when you have to, but yeah. when you don't have to, pull your feet around." And and make sure you hit Patrick Mahomes even misses some throws where you go, how how do he miss that? And then when you watch it again, you look at his feet and he just kind of got lazy because he's yeah. got this God's given gift that nobody else has to be having that arm talent, but still yeah. get your feet under you, you're gonna throw more accurately. So I always tell the mobile quarterbacks, watch Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. You're never gonna lose your mobility. Yeah, that's a gift. You have that but learn to throw the right way. So when I watch Dylan Gabriel, first of all, he's faster than you think. Yeah. He wants to run. He's he can go. Yeah. He's got a stronger arm than you think because he's not the biggest guy in the world. He'll he'll do the lefty thing. And I saw all lefties do this. They're just kind of feathered in there. He's got touch. He's got he throws a very catchable ball. And then when he has to, you're like, oh, there it is. There's, there's yeah. the heater. Like he has it. And so, and then he's very wily. He's very crafty. He's very like. It's almost like he's been in college forever and played for three different teams. Like he seems like, oh yeah, he, he has. Um, he knows so much about the game. Here's my point though. Here's what I'm getting to. I think that they're so good. And by the way, Tez, um, is it Tez Johnson is stud. He's, right. he's such a good player, such a good receiver. Love Tez. Love right. Tez. But, but Dylan Gabriel and, and this offense and even this team, I thought I saw it against us against UCLA and I saw it against um I saw it against Michigan State. They, they almost like look like they get a big lead and then they just go to sleep. Like like we're 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 gonna win and they just kind of coast. And I think Dan Lanning needs to kind of knock that out of them. You yeah. wait to coast until because against UCLA remember they didn't score in the third quarter or at yeah. least I don't think they did and if they did they got three. They it was it, they didn't look good at all. And it's almost like they took the foot off the gas. And I thought they did that against Michigan State, too. So, you know, I would tell them you're not going to get to do that, obviously, in this game. So I don't I don't think that's going to happen. But uh, I'm with you, though. They're going to have to be good on D. 
defense. Their offense is good enough. I think if they stay interested, and they will, they've got enough talent. Jordan James at running back is solid. He's really good. So I think they'll be good on offense. You nailed it, though. It's the other side of the ball. What are they going to do against the athletes? I'm forgetting his name right now. Who's number four for Ohio State? He's a young receiver. He's got so much. Is it Smith? I don't know what his name is. And I, I just got done watching the game, but he is good. So much talent. So I, you're right. Defensively, they're going to have to step up. They're going to be in trouble. I did see him sleepwalk through that second half with Aiden Childs and, and the Michigan State team. It's That's one thing I do understand that if you want to win and get in that final four and final two and win the national championship, you cannot sleepwalk throughout the whole game, especially the second half. Now, the whole four teams so far, Wayne, which team – surprisingly came out and shocked you so far is it the Oregon team is it SC which teams is shocking right now how they're playing right now yeah well probably UCLA um Oregon's what I thought they were I I, I felt me you do remember a few years ago when Dorian Thompson Robinson everybody thought he was probably gonna go pro and then he decided to stay yeah. you realize that Dylan Gabriel was he was a Bruin probably, only. was probably <laughs> coming to be a Bruin and I started watching his film and I went, ooh, I really like this guy. I'm, I'm texting him. I'm like, oh, we're going to get a good one. I mean, he's. I love his feet. I love his arm talent. I'm like, this guy's going to be really, really good. And then it didn't work out, which is fine, because Dorian had a great senior year, and it was fine. But but I, I, I really liked him. I, I thought what Dan Lanning's done, the way they've recruited, the talent they're bringing in, I I, I think the, the main goal for them is to just put it all together, right? You, you don't want to be Texas A&M where they spent all, millions and millions of dollars to bring in all this talent. Next thing you know, Jimbo Fisher is not coaching there anymore because it didn't work. You, you couldn't build the culture and you couldn't do that. So I, I thought Oregon would be good. Um, believe it or not, SC, I'm kind of like, yeah, I, I didn't, no one wants to hear this and everybody keeps talking about how much better their defense is. It's still not a great defense. No. Uh, SC's defense is just okay. It's better because remember last year it was horrible. They couldn't yeah. tackle. Dan Lynn is a very, very good coach, but they don't have Latu and the Murphys and Carl Jones. They don't have, yeah. and OSC fans don't want to hear this, but they don't have the talent that UCLA had on defense last year. That was a top 10 defense with the top player in the draft on the defensive side of the ball in Latu Latu. So yeah. they don't have that. Now, Kamari Ramsey was a Bruin who was a very good player and was one of my favorite players on the team last year and he's doing a great job but i still think usc is on the they're on the upward trend but they're not there yet and i talked i talked about that earlier i do like miller moss in that offense and i will always say lincoln riley can call a great game he can he'll do a good job um and and then washington again i i'm telling you this i jed fish was also there's so many coaches that have come through ucla that i've met i mentioned clark lee earlier yeah. He was on staff before he was a full-time coach. And I think it was new Heisel that hired him as a full-time coach. And I've watched him go on and do really, really good things. We've had so many coaches that have gone on and done really good things. Jed fish was a guy, I think, didn't he coach one of our bowl games? Wasn't he a head coach? I, I think he might've been. And I got to interview him and talk to him and I got to know him a little bit. And I'm like, I really like this guy. It's a bummer that what he did at Arizona and then he jumped ship to go to a bigger job, but that's the world we live in nowadays. I mean, people make lateral moves all the time. Now they don't, you know, and I, and, and so anyway, I, I'm not surprised with them either. As a matter of fact, the surprise with Washington, now that I've watched them and by the way, Will Rogers could play. Yeah, he could. Coleman as a running back kind of reminds me of like, it's like a Maurice Jones drew type, just, yeah. just a beast. The way he's not as good, but he's really good. Yeah. Those guys, those guys can play. So like I'm watching them and I know that jet fish can coach. And by the way, they're playing ridiculously good defense. So I'm looking at Washington going, man, this is a team that can win a lot of games down the stretch. Cause so yeah, it's, it's the, it's the Bruins. I thought we'd be a little bit better. I, I, I thought uh, the offensive line let me down the offensive line. I thought we brought in a couple guys that would plug some holes. I thought Garbers was going to be better, but he's been beat up and bashed and I don't, I don't really blame him. I thought a running game would be better and it hasn't been, but that all starts up front. So, so I, I, I was definitely wrong there. I thought we, I thought we'd be with that schedule three and two, you know, something like that instead of one and four. So I, I missed on that one. You know what? To, to that point, I think this weekend's game against Minnesota is crucial 
pivotal pivotal game to get Bruins more momentum going towards the latter half half the season. And to to your point too, Wayne, when you're talking about coaches, I think let's give Coach Foster an applause as well. He he went to a tough situation. That's not his guys. Number one, he didn't recruit any of these kids. Number one. Uh, he is recruiting right now. Carson Cox, one of the great four-star uh, running backs. He's going to be a Bruin next year. So to coaches, to Coach Foster's defense, the team is getting better week after week. He said it in a press conference. He sees it. I know the media sees it. I see it. You see it. The team's getting better, but he goes back to the execution level. Are they executing on plays, right? I see them in practice. Wayne, they're playing hard. The kids are executing in practice. This is not translating to the ball game. So so what's been what's been fun to watch is the one thing I've learned and I, I've covered college athletics for since 2001. So it's been a long time. Um, and I also played and I've seen players quit in my experience. I've seen players that are on the sidelines that are way more concerned about their individual stats than the team. I've seen everything you can imagine. Right. And so when I look at this team and the gauntlet, because again, I'm going to say this, if I, I can go down the list, I mean, if UCLA had played Washington's schedule of Weber State, Eastern Michigan, Northwestern's in there, and Washington State, those could literally be, I'm not saying they would be, but those could be four wins. With that yeah. schedule, they could have started off 4-0. We Agreed. don't know that because the worst team they've played in the last four weeks is ranked number 18 is undefeated. Right. Right? So it's like, it's it's kind of hard to know. And so, so to my point, Deshaun Foster has kept this team playing hard they wanted to score the touchdown at the end of the Penn State game so bad and everybody's out there giving it everything they had and they get that touchdown the defense never stops playing hard no matter how how much they're on the field no matter how much they're frustrated because they're not there's not enough points on the board they're still fighting and scratching and clawing the coaches I was in the locker room at the end of the Penn State game and I'm looking around and I, I don't see anybody happy but I also don't see any fighting I don't see anybody dejected because I've seen that too. I've seen people blaming other people in lockers. I've seen fights. I've seen all that stuff. And I'm looking around and I had a coach look me right in the eye and he's like, man, we are so close. Yeah. I just went, man, I go, I can see it. And I, and that you're nodding your head because you know, you can see it too. They're they're not, there's no quitting these guys. There's too many good players on this team. And if this O line, if this O line that is currently put together, which I think we're going to see the same starting lineup now going forward, barring injury, they're, they're better. They're, they're more athletic. We were too slow before. We, we have people that can move now. We have some athleticism. So now as, as quick as, as Coach Castillo can get them to not only be able to move, but now block the right guys and pick yeah. up the twists and stunts and blitz and all that stuff, then we're going to have a quarterback, whether it's Garber's back and healthy or Justin Martin. We're going to have a quarterback that can actually feel like, hey, I have all my guys blocked. I don't have to worry about this. I can go through my progressions as opposed to I have all my goals because this was happening at Garbers. I have all my guys blocked and yet a guy totally whiffs and then he gets killed. As a quarterback, I can promise you that is a terrible thing to have to deal with. You, yeah. When you get hit, and I, I still remember it's a, it's a great story. I'm playing Washington State. Anthony and we're playing up on the Palouse and it's cold and miserable. And back then the field was like concrete and I'm sitting there and I just get crushed. We're winning. We're up by a couple touchdowns. We're having a good game. It's getting near halftime and I get crushed. Okay. So I come out, I'm like, gosh, that I'm like, what happened? I go, who missed their block? They're like, you did. Like, what do you mean? I did. It was a safety blitz. You idiot. You didn't see it. I should have thrown a hot route. So it was my fault. I can live with that. By the way, I ended up in the hospital urinating blood after that hit. It was yeah. a horrible experience, but it was my fault. When you're a quarterback and the guys that are supposed to pick up the guys block the guys they're supposed to, as a quarterback, I promise you, it is an amazing feeling. But when when you're when your guys are missing blocks they should get, or if a running back's supposed to pick up a blitzer and they whiff, it makes it really hard to play the position. So UCLA has to figure that out. If they don't, they're gonna keep losing because Minnesota's a good team. They're not a great team, but they're a good team. So you're going to have to bring it. Thanks for sharing that story, Wayne. Um, yeah, people don't understand the mindset sometimes of these players. You know, it's 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 truly a family. And to your point, uh, after that Indiana loss, Coach Foster did say, hey, you know, what's, what's the good takeaway here? No bickering, no fighting. The team's together. They love each other. It's a family. And even George Carlin, after the Oregon loss, 
put his hand up and say, you know, I take full accountability. I didn't protect Ethan. He's on the ground. It's our fault. So I like what you said, Wayne. Uh, this team is going to do well probably towards the end of the year, carry that momentum to next year. I'm scared of how potent UCLA could be with the returning players, with the recruiting, uh, with a better O-line. I think we'll be okay uh, next year. And the momentum is great. You know, you see it. I see it. Yeah, I, I could be I could be making this up. But uh, I don't think I am. Sometimes I, I read so much and I have so many stats in my head that I, I could be wrong. But I'm pretty sure uh, as far as wins all time in, in the conference for the Pac-12 before it disbanded was USC, UCLA. And then I don't remember if it was or and then probably Washington and then Oregon. These are the top four. So and again, if you correct me and you find out I'm wrong, oh, well, they're pretty close to the top four if they're not. So yeah. this is historically some really good blue blood Pac-12 football yeah. programs that are going into an already elite conference. We wa- we grew up watching, you know, these teams playing the Rose Bowl. Yeah. We grew up, you know, I know I didn't get to my very my freshman year. I missed one trip with UCLA traveled to Michigan, and I'm so mad because I made the travel team. For the Tennessee trip, which, by the way, for those of you that think college football is so amazing now, back in my day, we would play Michigan and Tennessee in the same non-conference schedule. Wow. That was when college football was like, you you didn't really, we usually played two really good. We played Nebraska and Tennessee my senior year. Yeah. Like, it's like, it was awesome. But anyway, these are good programs. Yeah. UCLA has been in the last, you know, they've had a couple of good seasons, but I've said this forever, and I, I don't know if you agree. I, I feel like UCLA, and, and I know people are going to disagree with this too, but I feel like they can be a sleeping giant. They're, they're a program that's right there that if they just can get the right people and run the organization the right way, and, and this new chancellor is going to matter at UCLA that's coming in from Miami, if they take football and sports seriously and do this the right way, I, I think UCLA can recover pretty quickly and start and start going in the right direction. Yeah, and uh, don't chalk UCLA up as a win every game. They're going to play spoiling. They're going to be a very, very potent team going towards the end of the season. Wayne, let's let's go through the slew of uh, the schedule for the for the weekend and give a quick preview. Uh, let's talk about USC versus Penn State. It's a good good matchup. Penn State's favored by four and a half. What do you see in that game that you like? I, I would probably agree with that line, but here's what I will tell you. After watching Penn State up close and personal, and they only had Allen, they didn't have Singleton. They have two running backs. I think they're probably going to get Singleton back. I haven't heard yet. Um, but they have a two-headed monster. Everybody that that knows that Drew Aller was a big-time recruit, but I will say this, they protect him a little bit. They, they, they kind of are almost like one of those old-school NFL teams that – you know, won a Super Bowl with a quarterback that was like a game manager. And I know that sounds terrible, but like, I, I feel like after watching Rourke and after watching Dylan Gabriel and after ha- watching Nussmeyer at LSU, and then I watched Drew Aller and I went, yeah, he's a little bit mechanical. He's tall. He, he does have a strong arm, but they don't throw him very much. They want to run, 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 and then throw just a little bit. So here's my little trick for this game. If you're SC and you can get out in front of these guys, and take them away from their game plan because because SC can be very explosive. If you can get ahead a touchdown or two and make them chase, I think SC can pull the ups, upset here. If you let Penn State pound the rock and run it down your throat because this is going to be the best run game you've seen, well, that's that's not 100 percent true. They played Michigan too, but but this is right there. This is they're they're right there. They're the same type of team. They're going right. to try to pound it down your throat and run play action. And if they dictate, then Penn State's going to win. So I think the key to this one is going to be SC getting ahead so that Penn State feels like they have to chase because I don't think that's what they want to do. I agree. And I have SC winning that ball game, by the way, by seven points. Um, I know it's a, a hot take on that one. Let's go into uh, Iowa's – I'm sorry. Let's go into uh, our team, UCLA, going against Minnesota. What's that preview looking like, Wayne? Well, you know, I mean, again, uh, I, I can't hide my bias. I think if you look, if you're, if you can see me right now, you, you, you know where my allegiance here. Let, let me get out of the way. You know where, you know where I'm at here. Um, I, I, I really like with my heart. I, I think this is is a great opportunity for UCLA to get a win. You got to play a clean game. UCLA has to clean up the penalties. They have to stay in front of the sticks, and they're going to have to score more than 17 points. 
I think the defense can can do a good job. Darius Taylor, the running back number one for for Minnesota, is is good. Uh, Max uh, Bozmer is, is solid. Um, they 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 use Taylor. They run him and they will throw the ball to him quite a bit. Um, and so, but I think UCLA's defense is up to the task. But you cannot allow them to be on the field for eight years. Yeah. So the offense, and again, whoever plays quarterback on this new orchestrated line, and then some emergence of the running game against Penn State. Like if you take away the negative sack yards, they ran the ball better against a really good defense. So I think with Berger and I think with, you know, TJ and I think with Keegan and I think those guys are kind of finding their footing. I really like Berger. He had a run where he puts his foot in the ground and he can go. So I wouldn't be surprised if he starts getting more carries. And I I think he did against Penn State, but I think he will get even more this week. I think you can run the ball on Minnesota. I really do. And I think if UCLA could finally establish some sort of a running game, by the way, they have one of the best pass defenses in the country. They have yeah. 10 turnover, 10 interceptions. So Minnesota's pass defense is really good. That's why the run game is going to be the key. And I think UCLA is going to do that. I think they're going to win a close one. I don't know if it's three or seven, somewhere in that range. But I think UCLA gets to win at home. I agree with you. I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, I think they're going to use a little bit more Jalen Berger, get TJ in the mix. If they can run the ball, pound the ball down uh, Minnesota, I think uh, we have a great, great chance of winning and um, getting that win total up there. Now, uh, we talked about this game earlier, Ohio State against Oregon. Uh, Again, I think if Oregon can contain the run, they have a great chance. But unfortunately, I think Ohio State, too much firepower. So I think in that game, uh, Dwayne, my prediction, I think, uh, like I said earlier, I think Ohio State wins this by 10 points. But I think you see things a little bit differently because you cover this Oregon team directly. What's one thing, one strong suit that you see that Ohio State might be in a surprise for? The only the only thing that I, I was wondering about with Ohio State is I, I looked at their schedule and they really they were kind of like Ole Miss. Right. They had not played anybody and then they played a real game and they lost. Well, I, I, I know Iowa is probably not as good as they've been, but they're still Iowa and yeah. Ohio State. Like they still play defense. They, they still yeah. could they have a really good running back in, in Johnson and. Cade McNamara has been in a lot of big games. They're better on offense and they just, they didn't, Ohio State was just way better. So I went through, they hadn't played anybody yet to, okay, they're pretty good. And so I think Ohio State may be the best team in the country. I think they may be the favorite because it seems like Alabama and Georgia are a little bit less. By the way, Alabama and Georgia fans, that doesn't mean they're not awesome. I think Alabama will bounce back. I think Georgia's fine, but they're not so superior that they can play a bad game and win. And I think we've learned that already. So, so I think Ohio state has a shot, a real shot at a national championship. And so does Oregon. So I think this is going to be a really good game. I think Austin stadium matters. I think if you're Will Howard, you hope that your run game is on and you're not forced to throw a lot. I think even in this game, I don't think Ohio state wants to chase. I don't think they want to, I mean, I'm not saying Will Howard can't do it and I can't, I'm not saying those receivers can't do it, but I don't think that's the type of offense they want to run. I think they want to pound the rock and throw it when they want to throw it, not when they have to throw it. So if I'm Oregon, I want to get a lead early and I want to make Ohio state chase, but I'm with you. I got Ohio state. I don't know if it's 10. I don't know if it's seven. I don't know if it's three. I don't know if it's 14. I really don't know, but I will tell you this. If I don't get to see that game live, I will come home immediately and I will watch every, I I can't wait. That's a game you got to want to watch. There's so many good athletes on both sides of the ball. Definitely, definitely. And, uh, you know, game day is going to be there. Wayne, this is so fun. I think next week we're going to do is going to recap uh, the player of the week that we liked, the game of the week that we liked also. And, you know, go into some old stories. I know Wayne has a lot of uh, treasure troll full of like great stories. He just mentioned a few right now at Washington State. But Wayne... Great first episode so far. Can't wait to do the second one and so forth. And uh, any last words, Wayne, you want to want to leave uh, to, to leave cliffhangers for the next episode? Hey, listen, I, I love this idea of, of West Coast Big Ten. It seems strange. It seems weird. Um, I'm just looking forward to these programs really becoming a part of that footprint. Um, I will tell everybody that's listening that the travel is real. Yep. I mean, I'm, I, I, I didn't think Penn State was going to be as – it was fun, but, man, it was a lot. I'm going to Rutgers next week. Like, holy cow. 
we've already been to LSU and that, I know that's not a part of conference, but there's going to be travel. But as we're learning, the teams coming out West also have to deal with that. Also, that's yeah. actually a factor. All these teams that are traveling out, that's a big, long trip. And I'm telling you, the stats are showing it this year. Teams that are traveling long distances are doing, it's quite a, they're, they're not doing nearly as well. So we saw Miami almost lost to Cal. Yeah. So, and they probably should have lost to Cal. Cal kind of blew that. So, yeah. so it's, it's difficult to make that trip. So all these teams coming out West, good luck. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. The travel's real. And, uh, I, I just can't wait. This is it, football is fun right now because it feels like every week we've got a, just an absolute ton of really good football games. I agree. You know, what's weird though, too, though, Wayne, seeing Miami, the West coast calling themselves an ACC team and seeing Cal Stanford being an ACC. I just can't see it. I, I still see Jim Harbaugh, the sidelines, uh, you know, calling games. So it's, it's kind of new to us and, you know, we'll get used to it again. It's a weird time in college football. I know that they're going to crack down on certain things, especially the NIL, uh, the transfer portal. I think they're le- lessening the time weighing on that one, the window, uh, a lot, a lot of cleaning up to do, you know, in the programs. Well, I mean, I, I, I know we, we could talk about this stuff all day. I, I, I think the cleaning up needs to start. And then this is just, again, my opinion, you've got to figure out a way to stop tampering. You've got to make NIL real NIL. It can't just be pay for play. And uh, we've heard Nick Saban say this on college game day. I mean, and it's like when the, when the best minds that have ever been around the game are saying this, it, the, the way that the current model is being done is, is not sustainable. Um, offering kids millions of dollars out of high school is dumb. They haven't done anything yet. I mean, you come to school and you can earn your NIL money the right way. And I'm okay with paying players out of a, like the, there's a, they, they t- they're talking about that $22 million that's going to, well, yeah, that's fine. Players can get extra money, but the way we're doing pay for play, which is not NIL, and the, the transfers are out of control. Players are going to start coming up to play. Like we saw with the, and I don't know the story behind the Vegas kid, but you're seeing SC lost Bear Alexander. Like people are going to yeah. walk after it, like, cause you know, they have the four game rule until yeah. you can transfer or until you can save your year. I mean, players are going to hold out mid season. I mean, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to happen unless we change things. So they're going to have to tighten it up. And I think there's enough smart people out there. I mean, it's funny how quickly we went from having all these rules to having none. Yep. It's, it's easy to go down the wrong road. It's really hard to go back down the right road. So like, hopefully they, there's some sanity and we get things going back in the right direction. And again, I'm not opposed to players getting money. Yep. It's just the way we're doing it right now is insane. Absolutely insane. One quick story for let you guys go is uh, I remember talking to Mike when I met, I met Mike Wynn in person, by the way, a month ago, we, we talked about that, uh, connected with him. He told me a story about Donnie Edwards receiving some groceries on his front door. And there was a whole investigation about that. I don't know if you remember that, but Mike just told me about that story and it shocked me seeing how the climate has changed. And you know what, from Donnie Edwards getting investigated for a bag of groceries is crazy compared to what's going on right now in the days of uh, college football. Things have changed a ton. I just saw Donnie Edwards last week. Donnie is, uh, he's one of the, the best, UCLA football players ever had a great NFL career and what he's doing for our veterans in the military right now is insane. I don't know if you saw his special on, I think it was on CBS. I forget, but Donnie Edwards is a class act. And, and yeah, when, when, when we played, you know, in that era, and I don't care if it was the SC players or the UCLA players, there was always agents around. There was always people with money around. There was always, and you had to be very diligent about like, you know what? Yeah, I, I can't. I, I, I know it's just a movie ticket, but I, I can't. And some people don't have that kind of willpower. Seems kind of dumb looking back on it now. Like, you know, if you had someone saying, hey, come to this place, I'll give you a free haircut. You're like, you know what? I don't think I can do that. You couldn't get a free haircut. You really couldn't. Wow. And because, you know, and so it's just, it's so difficult. But I always tell people we knew the rules to the game back then. Yeah. And when I see a guy like Donnie Edwards or a guy like Jonathan Ogden or a guy like JJ Stokes or myself or any of these great players, or even players that were on the other side, you know, that I played against like Teddy Bruschi and all these people, Willie McGinnis and all these great players that played during my John Lynch played in my era. Some of my teammates have gone on to be GMs and stuff like that. Dave Roberts was in school and I was in school. He's, you know, he's coaching the Dodgers. Hopefully they get that win uh, and win that series against the Padres. But, all of these people played and got a scholarship and that's it. 
And they've gone on to have ultra, ultra, ultra successful lives because they used that scholarship to their benefit. And they use all they learned from playing sports. And they used all those life skills that you get that you really can't get doing other things. And they turned it into amazing careers. We're living in the world right now where we're acting like this is the only time in their lives these kids are ever going to have the opportunity to make money. And that's a load of bull crud. It's just, that's not true. If you take advantage of the opportunity, kids now are getting master's degrees before they're done with their scholarships because of COVID. Yeah. And you take advantage of that stuff. You're going to have a great life. Now, if you got an extra hundred or whatever thousand, when you graduated college, that'd be amazing. Like you'd have a down payment on a house and it'd be a great way to start your life. But it, you, we're, we're, the way we're doing it now, it's almost like we're all selling our souls. Like it's, it's the whole, I, always, I, I, I know I'm rambling right now, but I got to say this. I always tell the kids when they, when, when I teach them, cause I'm a school teacher, if you don't, yeah. know, if you don't know. And when we do the gold rush, I always tell them, I go, the entrepreneurs were the ones that made the money. The ones yeah. selling the mining equipment and owning the hotels and the bars and the, you know, casino, whatever, all that stuff. They were making the money. Very few people that went and dropped everything, left their families, left their homes and just went, I'm going to go get rich quick. Yeah. Doesn't work. You, you, I'll leave, this, I'll leave this with one player that, that I'd admire to what you just said, Wayne, who's taking advantage of the college system here and UCLA is Chase Griffin, right? Yeah, yeah. Love that kid. Hope to, hope to have him at the end of the uh, year, have uh, the program. But yeah, that's that's one player that's taking advantage of the system and, uh, you know, got his two master's degree already, um, you know, taking advantage of this great public school system. So Chase, Chase Griffin, shout out to you. Uh, yeah. Keep doing what you do and you're doing the right thing. NIL the right way. NIL the right way. He's done NIL the right way. I mean, he's 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 built himself a platform that is so sturdy that you can't imagine him being anything but he's already successful. But like the next stage of his life, it's like just send out a newsletter, Chase, and let us know how you're doing because he's gonna crush it. I agree to that. All right, Wayne, fantastic first episode, guys. We'll see you guys next week. With week two of West Coast Big Ten, this is uh, Anthony Wynn and Wayne Cook signing off from the Sporting Tribune.